here we are at the first ever Intra-Africa Trade Fair. Uh, this is not just a common, it's not just a regular trade fair. I know there are 70,000 people attending and there's over 1,000 exhibitors. There's a conference that runs all the way to the closing ceremony on Monday. Um, but this is part of the Intra-Africa journey. It's part of the African Continental Free Trade uh, area's agenda, to push the agenda forward. So it's not just that straightforward trade fair. Africa has decided to trade with Africa. Now this is something that Kwame Rukuma, yesterday, if you were at the opening ceremony, Kwame Rukuma, they, they came up a, a video of Kwame Rukuma talking about Africa trading and Africa working together with Africa regional. A lot of people here are coming in here and vaguely understanding intra-African trade talk less of the finance. So I want to begin, I think, by um, perhaps starting with Jean-Louis. Um, you, this is not your first rodeo, as they say. You've been um, around intra-African trade financing for most of your career. So I think it would be uh, better to ask you generally, maybe to speak for a few minutes on the topic. We're talking about improving the environment for enhancing, enhancing intra-Africa trade. Very broad question, but just give us your thoughts on the overall topic. How do we do it? A session on a strategic plan. If I, uh, looking at the, the, the topic in itself, but I think if we want to uh, focus on intra-African trade and how to uh, uh, improve also access to finance from most of those international banks that are uh, kind of retrenching from uh, the, the, the continent. Uh, the situation reminds me of the one we were experiencing in the 80s when most international banks for a different reason at this at that time they were talking about the uh, debt crisis. Uh, this time around we're talking about governance related issues. Uh, most international banks are worried about uh, uh, KYC issues, know your customer issues, or anti-money laundering issues, and uh, also uh, certain regulatory issues because some of the <coughs> commercial banks in our continent are experiencing uh, difficulties. Now how to address these kind of challenges uh, I think primarily there is a role for uh, what is generally uh, called multilateral development financial institution, the like of uh, African Development Bank, uh, Afrexim Bank, so on, who, which are institutions that have uh, gone on the markets, on the international market, and have uh, built up experience and also profile on that market. So uh, I believe the primary, primary role should be one of those institutions, getting together, addressing this uh, challenge uh, together. There is tremendous amount of um, funding available in the continent itself already. Uh, so I, I hear this often. The money is out there. There's a tremendous amount of money. Just to just put a bit of meat on the bone there. Uh, what is it? Where is it? Okay. Uh, savings, if you look at pension funds and, uh, and the like, there, are, there is money. Uh, those institutions themselves, uh, I believe, uh, ADB, AAA rated, Trade Development Bank, uh, Afrexian Bank, uh, Investment Grade rated, they can go and raise the money. I don't think the real issue is the money. Uh, the money could be found. Uh, how you will use the money is a uh, key. Uh, at Afrexin Bank, we use structured trade finance as a way to ensure that the risk is properly mitigated and people uh, feel comfortable. Uh, if, I, if I ask you to just give money to someone you don't know who come and say you would like to do certain type of business. Uh, you want to know who that person is and uh, if uh, through that business he will be able to uh, repay you. So 
That's the role of the banker, to mitigate those risks. And, I'm, uh, I, and I believe getting together those institutions and to improve the risk perception itself, yeah. uh, there is a, a, a key role that they, they can play. I'm going to come back to you on risk perception and Africa in a, in a moment, but I'll just turn to uh, Mubarak Elekbede. Um, Mubarak, um, the International Islamic Trade Finance Corporation, of course, has a big role to play across Africa's 54, depending on who's counting, if it's African Union, 55 uh, countries. Um, just maybe uh, by way of an opening gambit, if you could just sort of introduce your organization and where it fits in with all this. is You must be excited about uh, this, this wave, this movement, but I mean, what does it mean to ITFC? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as, you said, as you said, let me introduce ITFC. ITFC um, is a member of the Islamic Development Bank Group. Um, the Islamic Development Bank Group itself has uh, 57 member countries. Uh, 27 of those member countries are on the African continent. So we do a bit of uh, trade bit finance business here um, on the African continent. Um, essentially, for ITFC, we are into uh, trade financing because we are uh, one arm of the Islamic Development Bank. We have other entities that finance other things um, in Africa, like the Islamic Development Bank itself deals mainly with the governments and um, big project financing. Um, so for ITFC, we finance uh, short-term commodities. Uh, and um, for us, this is very important, the intra-Africa trade business. So let me just get that clear. clear. But most, of the, um, most of the financing you're doing is like in PPIs and, and in, in the government space, in, in, in government-initiated in projects. Public and private. Public and private. We do yeah. public and private sector financing. Yeah. However, as you know, you have more challenges in the private sector. It seems easier for you to deal with the government rather than deal with the private sector. Yes, yes. But uh, we're trying to also improve that environment. As Mr. Ekro said, um, the, the way to go about it is to have the partnership of the multilateral institutions. Why? Because you have um, the multilateral institutions usually have like more leverage than the commercial, purely commercial enterprise. And in addition to that, we have the development mandate to sort of assist the countries where we have partnership to, to support their development objectives. So for ITFC, what we do in Africa is we try to follow the data and then we uh, partition the continent in a way it's easier for us to do business. What, what data? Where are you finding um, data? That's always a challenge. Yes, um, the, the trade organization WTO has data. Uh, we have several data agencies. They're all out there. You commission them. You pay a little bit of fee for, you, for, for it, and they do the data mining for you. And you can sort the data and determine where you want to be on the value chain of the risk. So, um, for instance, um, as Mr. Ekra said on the structured trade finance, we do a bit of structured trade financing on the African continent where we work with uh, collateral managers, where the commodity becomes the collateral for the trade. Uh, now, now talk on this issue now of improving the environment for intra-Africa trade. And if you can talk about South-South trade financing, that's fine. But let's just talk about how do we improve the environment uh, for, for supercharging intra-Africa trade from your experience. What do we need to do next? Um, I think it's, it goes a lot to governance and clarity and uh, having a better understanding of the trade flow. For us at ICFC, for instance, we're based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. We have a, a regional office in Dakar, Senegal. We have another one in Rabat, Morocco. Reason, because we're, we can be everywhere, right? So we try to locate strategically based on the resources available to us. And then what do we do? We partner with local and regional institutions including, for instance, in Africa, Afrexim Bank, uh, Trade and Development Bank in Eastern Africa, Ecobank, for instance, which has, I think, spread in about 34 countries yes. in Africa or thereabouts. So you see, the way we're looking at it is um, you need to understand the risk. You need to manage it, and you need to see where the trade flows are going. Um, in Africa, for instance, not a lot of um, African countries trade together. Yeah. 
I think 15% of trade is uh, intra-Africa trade. So we need to improve on that. How do we do that? We need to see the countries in Africa that have a comparative advantage in producing and exporting something. And then we support them to do that better. And then we connect the markets. Okay, so at ITSC, for instance, we do what you call um, reverse linkage. We try to see the countries that are doing something better, that are willing to share maybe for a fee or for other advantages with other countries in Africa, the expertise. That's where you can keep growing everybody together. Give me an example of what you've done recently. Uh, for instance, in um, Senegal, we do uh, granite financing. Uh, in Gambia, they also do granite as a product. So you have right. a duplication of products, yeah? Yes, so, but what it is, is Senegal has uh, what you call a better experience managing that um, than Gambia has. In Gambia, recently, we spo uh, sponsored a program called the aflatoxin um, program, which is like helping them to get rid of the aflatoxin, which is a fungus in granite growing. So if you're not in that market, you may not know that. Yeah. So when you are able to remove the fungus in your granules, it improves the quality and you're able to export to better markets. So we study this kind of uh, things in commodities and then we see how we can replicate them across. Well, excellent, excellent. Thank you for your first intervention. Uh, Madam, you've been very patient. Uh, so, I, and I appreciate that, but we really want to hear from Xu Jiang, uh, Deputy General Manager of the Trade Finance Department of China, Exim Bank. Um, I, I want to actually ask you to certainly comment on improving the environment uh, for, for enhancing intra-Africa trade, but I also want to ask you as well, for the members of the audience who don't know, just to introduce not just uh, China Exim Bank, but where China Exim Bank plays a part in the intra-Africa trade movement that we see here and the African continental free trade area. What part? Because um, I must say that for the uninitiated, when we say intra -Af improving intra-Africa trade, there is in some quarters um, a subconscious belief that we are drawing our wagons in a circle, that Africa is closing in on itself because that's the general feeling Globally, you know, you're looking at what's happening in the United States and elsewhere. There's a there's a lot of protectionism. We're sort of going against the the the, the, the bucking the trend. But here in Africa, if you speak to anybody who's initiated and understands what we're trying to do, we're not. We're trying to harmonise a, a market that is going to be the biggest trade area since the creation of the WTO, with billions of people and trillions of dollars of opportunity. And that is a market that outside uh, partners, such as finance institutions like yourself, or, uh, or, or businesses that trade, can also be a part of uh, Africa's success story, so to speak. So I want you to, first of all, introduce who you are, and then tell us how you plug into this story of intra-Africa trade and AFCFTA. Uh, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, it's actually it's a little weird for me to be, because this is an intra-Africa uh, you know, trade affair, and I'm from the outside of Africa. Um, I think um, there are three points that I'd mention. Firstly, of course, we all know that trade is um, trade and trade finance is very important uh, for an economy, and that's exactly the case for China's past development, who has benefited a lot uh, from a dynamic trade since China's opening up uh, 40 years ago. And secondly, um, the uh, trade, domestic trade in China and also intra-Asia uh, continent trade is very um, dynamic. I, I, know little about uh, Africa, but uh, as far as I know, the intra-Africa trade is not so active compared to China and Asia. And Africa's trade is uh, mostly dependent on the external demands. So um, there's a few, very few uh, African countries um, regard the other African countries as its primary, uh, you know, the trade partner. So uh, 
um, that I think that is uh, what this intra Africa trade fair is focused on to promote the inner uh, intra continent uh, trade flows and uh, thirdly is that um, I think how to improve the uh, the trade flow both intra Africa and you know the uh, Africa with other parts of the world. Um, the thing I'd like to mention is that we should look at trade finance in a bigger picture. So um, it's not only just to, you know, the, uh, to finance the trade itself, but we have to look at trade finance in, um, I think, in a supply chain point of view. So that would include the uh, upstream uh, suppliers and downstream uh, distributors. And also we can look at the thing uh, from an uh, industrial chain point of view. That would include the production of the goods that is to be exported and imported. And thirdly, um, if we look at from a value chain point of view, that would include even earlier stage as design and even after sales, uh, after sales services. So um, what China is um, actively engaged in Africa's infrastructure uh, sector. I mean, uh, I think infrastructure is a very important component of the uh, capability to export. So. Um, I think we, we just do separately look at infrastructure and trade. They are somehow very closely correlated in the sense of building up the capacity to export in the future. So um, we are China Indian Bank, we have many um, infrastructure and factories and those uh, projects in Africa. Many of them are trade related so uh, we think it as uh, another way to improve Africa's trade ability, uh, improve its trade performances. That's a wonderful first answer. Thank you very much. And I'll come back to you in a minute. But I want to go back to uh, uh, um, Mr. Ekra. Um, do financial institutions uh, here in Africa, they, do they, what do they um, uh, need to do in order to better facilitate intra-Africa trade? What are they not doing at the moment? I mean, um, do you know any, say, financing schemes abroad uh, that are being used overseas that would benefit if they were introduced here? What do they need to do? Or, and also, actually, let me step back. You speak to all these organizations. Do they know what they need to do? Um, or are you educating them? <laughs> The, the, the With your word, fast experience. The, the, the word educating you reminds me of something else. Okay. Uh, first of all, the, the, you, you know, uh, banks tend first to follow the customers. Uh, if you look at the history of banking in Africa, uh, you had primarily the major banks of the UK who were following the customer going to trade in Africa, yeah. the major banks of France, and so on. And they adapt to the customer and, and, and the environment. And they follow, they yeah. follow the customer, yeah. because yeah. banks have relationship with <coughs> these customers. So if you have a large group uh, in, in the UK who wants to trade or to do uh, manufacturing or export <coughs> from Africa, the banks will follow them. So you would look at the banking uh, map of Africa. It was historically dominated by those historical banks, you know, the Barclays and so on. To uh, en enable trade among African countries, which is not historically uh, what was, uh, be was designed to happen. Yes. Originally, the trade was designed to happen between Africa and Europe. Yeah, pre-colonial and post-colonial structures meant that you were right. exporting raw materials so, and importing manufactured so, goods. So the banking system is not uh, designed for that originally. So you need to 
to work on it. Yeah, it's now, a culture shift. Yeah, you have to work mm. on that. And to work on it, uh, the same way we are currently doing uh, the intra-African trade fair, so that uh, a, a Ghanaian company understands a Zimbabwean one and so on. So if you want to trade a product with other uh, countries, you need to understand it. You, know, you need to understand demand, you need to understand the market. Same way, if someone trades from Ghana to Zimbabwe and he wants to use the banking system to, to pay for the payment, the banks need to, to understand each other. They need to know each other. If you have a bank in Zimbabwe issuing a letter of credit for a, an import from Ghana, that letter of credit needs to be confirmed by a bank in Ghana so that uh, the exporter from Ghana will get his money. Uh, so you need to have this relationship. Uh, that relationship uh, infers understanding of the risk. Yes. Uh, that word again, risk. It's, it's largely, uh, risk is a very important uh, factor indeed from the financing standpoint. Mm -hmm. From the production standpoint, it's a different issue. But from the financing, uh, you need to understand the risk. You need Can to understand the risk of the customers. Yeah. So if you are uh, <coughs> here in Egypt, and someone tells you about National Bank of Egypt or, or Commercial Bank of Egypt, people here understand them. Mm. They know these are the largest bank here. But if you ask a, even an Algerian or even a Tunisian, maybe he doesn't understand. He doesn't know that. So you need to work on that mechanism. And to work on that mechanism, that's why I say there is an, a, a, a good role for those multilateral development finance institutions who are operating. They are operating in, across the continent. So they understand this better. And they can add some security to, uh, the, uh, to the trade, to the trade flow. They can, for instance, uh, add their own confirmation. Uh, at the beginning, it may be more expensive for the trade to, to happen. Yeah. But as uh, uh, operators and banks uh, know about themselves, then the risk uh, gradually will be, will be reduced. Uh, the Exim China mm. uh, experience about trade, and everybody now knows that trade is a very, very important uh, tool for uh, development and, and growth. Uh, but for trade to happen, there are certain <coughs> preliminary things that, needs that need to be, to be put in place, yeah. Need to be put in place. Uh, there are one, two, three panelists, but there's a fourth one, you, uh, and you, all of you. <laughs> so I expect you to wade in with your questions and comments, yes. Uh, don't throw anything at the stage, but only sort of ideas. That's all you're allowed to. So ready your questions, because I'm coming to you in a moment. But I want to stay on this issue of risk. I was in Sharm El Sheikh with LCC and Paul Kagame uh, doing a panel. Uh, and a number of other panels. And, and one thing that kept coming up was risk, that word risk. Increasingly, it almost feels as if it's really coming to the fore now as this intra-African uh, uh, future becomes a reality. Uh, so one of the panelists said something very interesting. He said there's a massive gulf, big, 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 big space that between real risk of African investments and opportunities and perceived <laughs> risk Perception. of African opportunities. Something that every single time you step out of this, the, uh, this continent, you're having to, in, in many ways, demystify for people who are interested or, about, or are in the process uh, of, uh, of investing uh, time, money, effort, whatever it is, into Africa. Um, I just want you, uh, Mubarak, to speak on this, because surely this is not new to you. This is something you have to deal with uh, 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 every, every week. Yes, um Yes, um, what we do for managing the risk, it's um, the local players understand the local producers better. Okay, so you have to layer it. 
For instance, there's a local bank in a local state somewhere in any country. It knows the customer producing anything in that environment better. Okay? He may not have the liquidity to finance the deal, but he knows the risk. You sitting somewhere, maybe at national level or international level, can partner with that local institution. So over in Jeddah, you're sitting in Jeddah, that's your guy? Yes, that's my guy. So I give him a win-win situation, and we work on a partnership arrangement that works for both of us. Yeah, give me an example of one of the partnership so, arrangements. So, for instance, if there's a bank I identify in a country, I have certain prudential guidelines they have to comply with so I can finance them. Most financial institutions comply with some sort of regulation or, or the other that is standardized internationally. So it's easier to work with them. So they may necessarily, not necessarily have the liquidity to finance certain transactions. Why? Because it's not going to bring them immediate profit. But I can convince them as a multilateral institution that in the long run, this little producer can become something big in the future. And these partners that you get, my feeling is often they're probably not at the level of professionalism and processes that, that, that often you, that you would be happy with. Do you, do you guide them? Do you support them to strengthen themselves in order to be uh, a good partner to you? How do you do that? Yes, you can, um, you can start with the big players. Oftentimes, we like to start with the established players yeah. so that you can have some several, uh, level of comfort in the local economy you're going to. Yeah. Um, then you graduate it and start to look for the uh, medium tier players. And the win for the medium tier player is if they work with you medium to long term, the they will be able to grow. So, in yeah, it's definitely a win win situation for them. I can imagine if you walk through the door, they're happy to see you. Yes, yeah, so that's the incentive. Yeah. We have the liquidity, we can raise the liquidity. In the international market, for us as an institution, for instance, singly we're rated A1. We have partnership with the Islamic Development Bank, our parent body that is triple A. So along that line, we can raise liquidity. However, the people that come along with us also want to know that we're doing the right thing by taking their money to where they, do not, they are not able to go. So that's where our job comes in, to be able to work with the local partner. So we have to set, it's, um, sometimes it's slow, but if you do it steadily, you'll get to where you're going. Um, we have been doing it at least 10 years directly now at ITFC with the IDB since 1975. So, yes, it may be painstaking, it may take some time, but if you steady the cost, I mean, if you keep the cost steady, you'll get to where you're going. Uh, let me move on to China, China Exim Bank. Um, just to, uh, one of the questions, one of the biggest challenges that we see uh, in moving the dial and moving uh, things along within trade uh, and with infra infrastructure development here in Africa. One thing that we hear constantly mm -hmm. is, is the challenge to find bankable projects. And not just to find bankable projects, but even when you find a bankable project, the procedures and processes around it are not in place in order for the finance to find the opportunity. Um, China Exim Bank has been very good in partnering uh, across Africa uh, to make ideas in, into realities, physical realities that we can see. Perhaps you can tell us some ways that you deal with that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the trade and those big projects are different stories <coughs> here. So um, if we look at uh, big projects, uh, infrastructure pr projects, we can struct structure it, you know, um, with uh, different participants who share the risk uh, separately. But for trade, you know, the, the volume and the frequency, considering of that, so there is no time to process. Uh, so um, my idea is the same with the gentleman uh, who spoke earlier, that let the prof uh, professionals do the professional jobs. So uh, I think the cooperation between banks is very important. So, you know, as a, as a credit, uh, export credit agency, China is in bank, like China is in bank. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, we have our constraints in supporting those uh, trade deals 
because we are limited in the number of personnel, we are limited uh, in the number of branches, and so we are we don't have enough people to know every trade partners in the world. So the idea that is that we work with the local financial institutions, the commercial banks, and they know in, their in the customers. Same way that you do. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing is that the export credit agencies and the multilateral financial institutions should play a bigger role in this to bridge the different uh, countries and continents. So if like China Exim Bank, we work with local Chinese banks and African Exim Bank work with the African banks. And so, and the China Exim Bank and African Exim Bank, we are cooperate with each other so yeah, we can expand yeah, So our that's where the connection network. is. Yes. Yeah, I see. Yes. And it's, it works effectively. I mean, what would you, if you had a crystal ball that could look into the immediate future, say like five years into the future, how would you like to see that situation get even better? What would you like if you had a magic wand and you could wave it right now? I think, I think we do. I, I think the future is bright. And Say uh, we can say that for China we used to export to Africa a lot, but nowadays we put more emphasis on the uh, import side. Now there's a uh, five, bi five billion US dollar uh, Africa export to China fund, special fund announced uh, earlier this year at the uh, 2018 uh, Beijing summit of you know China Africa Cooperation Forum, which is specially used to finance export, uh, Africa export to China. So uh, I think we will have a more balanced trade uh, in the future. Yeah. Uh, I'm now going to go to the audience. Can I go to the audience and find out if they have uh, um, anything to ask you? You can hold on to that microphone. You're the only one allowed a microphone. Uh, the rest of them have to use the ones on the... But uh, Jean-Louis Ecret is used to that. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break protocol, as Marketo likes to do, and step off the stage. Do not be afraid. I'm going to go now with my microphone. And uh, if you don't put up your hands, then I'm going to pick on you. Um, but we are beholden to the volatilities and the vagaries uh, of currency volatility and all the, the multiplicity of how many currencies there are across there. You guys are by, you guys are in the middle of this. I'm not an expert in the, in the fi finance. I'm just an enthusiast. Make some sense of this. How does this play into it? How do we get past it? What are some of the solutions? Perhaps maybe uh, Mr. Ekra. Difficult question, I know. Uh, I'm happy also that you say it's, uh, it's difficult because uh, a lot of people talk about things they don't understand. So it's. Uh, and, and that's not the way I've been educated. I try to speak about things I properly understand. And money is one of the most <laughs> difficult things to understand. Uh, it's one of the most difficult ones. You can ask any economist who have gone through, through it. It's not a straightforward uh, matter. Uh, and then when you start putting emotion into it, so it's more complex because there's, there's always money and emotion in money. Because, because emotion is another one that is also more complex. Now maybe to come, come to think that we can uh, 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 try to, uh, to work on. Uh, if you have two currencies, no matter how they are managed from one place to the other, then you have an exchange risk. You don't have an exchange risk when it's only one currency. Then you have an exchange risk. And your problem is how do you mitigate that risk when you are in, a, in, an, in an activity, whether business or, or, or else. Uh, one way to do it uh, from a trade or regional trade perspective is for certain institutions who are going to land into a particular country is to try and raise money from that particular country. So that domestic, yes. Yeah, so you'll raise it domestically yeah. so that the, uh, the trader is not exposed at least to that particular risk mm -hmm. because he will uh, uh, borrow in local currency yeah. 
and you will repay in local currency. Yeah. So and he, he's doing his business. So you, 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 you will deal with that. Uh, and Afrexin Bank or any of those uh, banks involved into promoting uh, trade will, could go and raise money in the local market. Mm -hmm. uh, we now know that, again, institutional investors, pension funds, or even uh, individuals uh, could be interested in uh, buying certain instruments uh, which are backed by institutions that are known, where you know that you are not going to lose uh, your, your money o o overnight. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, during the so-called structural adjustment program, yes. many institutions were closed. Yes. Now, uh, yes, I they shut up shop. Yeah, yeah, but you you yeah. have your money there as yeah. a, as a, as an individual. You you open your account in that institution, and overnight, uh, you hear yes. that the, the the financial institution is going to be closed, and you go there. You want to get your money back, the, your poor savings. Yes, you're standing outside waiting, and, queuing and you, with and you a lot wait, of desperate and people. You wait and you queue. Yeah. So, so those, how do you deal with this kind of risk? Is uh, again, from an, an, an institutional perspective, uh, an institution like Afrexim or ADB or the like can mitigate those risks because they are more solid than, 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 than others. Uh, so raising money in the uh, local market can be one way. Uh, the, because in, for many African currencies, because mm. you can have your currencies, not the, the real problem. But many of them uh, cannot, uh, you cannot edge properly fluctuation mm. because there is no uh, sophisticated market mm. uh, on both sides. Yeah, it's still to, immature. Yeah. You, you know, to, to, to mitigate yes. future, you have to have someone who in the future wants your money. Exactly. And you now want to, 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 to yeah. send your money there. So most, many markets are not uh, prepared for that. Mm, they're, stuck in, of, they're stuck in the now, the immediate. Correct. Mm. That's, uh, 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 Mubarak, I see you smiling, nodding your head. Do you want to comment on this before I move on? Uh, just uh, cu currency can be complicated as Mr. Ekra says, but you have to just decide um, where on the risk you want to, on the chain of the risk you want to play. Mm. For instance, they're saying the uh, assets and liabilities can be converted in local currency so you don't have the exchange risk. Mm. Another way is probably to ring fence the receivable. Mm. So for instance, uh, you are financing cotton exports from a country. Mm. The supply contract for that cotton is in a foreign currency. Mm. So maybe you can have the assignment of receivable coming from the supplier um, uh, from the from what you're the receiver of the the, the goods so that's where your you, your financing in foreign currency the receivable is also coming in for in the same foreign currency that's where you mitigate your risk that's where one another way of doing it so but um, the for currency what is important to know is to know about the specific specificity of the risk exactly you want to address and then you find the right tool to to do that, and the expertise is in the market to do that, you know, and I think it can be managed. Excellent answers. Um, I'm looking at my watch and I realize that, I know we started late, but we're five minutes late. I don't know if uh, no one's keeping time, so we're just gonna keep going. Um, I'm gonna come over here to this gentleman here. Please stand up. Um, okay, uh, your name's Stephen Kaumu from Afrexin Bank. I've heard of Afrexin Bank. Okay, uh, what's your question, sir, or comment? Yes, thanks very much. Um, I'm from a Frexin Bank, as you've said, and when I attend conferences of this nature, one of the things that people ask me every time they know that I work for a Frexin Bank is, um, how can we get financing? How can we access financing? Now, many of these people that ask this question typically tend to be people that are in the small to medium-term enterprise space. It won't be the large corporates, obviously, because that's a different story. So I just wanted to understand um, from the panelists the financing gap at SME level. How do they address it? I know what Afrexim Bank is trying to do. So perhaps to hear from um, IDB and from China Exim Bank, from their own experience, how do they deal with that? Yes, maybe China Exim Bank. And we have to make this the last, uh, the last interaction because we, we need to uh, wrap up. So please, madam. 
SME. SMEs, um, that is a headache for export import bank like China Asian Bank because we do have limited access to the you know, vast numbers of uh, corporate clients, especially SMEs. So, and still we have to cooperate with other institutions in China. The government is now uh, encouraging to the set up of some we call foreign trade service, complex service pet platforms. They used to be the agent companies that help the SMEs to export, dealing with those you know, custom clearings, the tax refund, the, the export insurance things. Now they have more functions like uh, providing short-term uh, trade finance to those SMEs. And what's more important is that uh, after uh, some types of operation, they accumulate a database from which they know who are the good exporters, who have the best import partners. So um, through cooperating with those kind of platforms, we can select the, uh, the, you know, the, S the good SMEs to cooperate with, and also we can finance the platform so, and let them to finance the, uh, the SMEs. That, that's what we are trying to do.